you know, my last video covering where theists use terms that are not theirs to use, but they're confused about them, but they think they're right and they use them and they, it's just wrong. My last video was on that. I'll post the link below, but it was so fun. I decided to do another one because there's so much of that. Um, what I want to do actually is maybe this video kind of a little bit more on how to deal with militant YouTube Christians. There's a lot of different kinds of Christians, thousands and thousands of denominations. We know that people are not following the teachings of the Bible. They're making the Bible adjust to them. That is how we get that many denominations. And we know why that happens, right? It happens with the mindset that says, if I just believe in and worship God, I'm going to heaven. That's not following a path. That is sit back and look at it. That's idol worshiping. And anyone who wants to argue that the Ten Commandments are a set of rules to follow, I would say that, oh, I don't know. I, I would say bonobos probably follow six or seven of those automatically. But there's so much diversity within that. I, so I want to be careful when I say Christians. When I'm using Christians, it sounds like a blanket term. And it's so difficult to have these conversations without doing that. Because there are always exceptions. There are YouTube militant Christians that I want to specifically target here. There are Christians that I know of that I've hiked up in the mountains with and things like that that don't get on YouTube and do this stuff. They don't act this way. And they don't become nutcases for the religion that represent it so poorly that you're like, oh my God, I don't want anything to do with your religion, buddy. If you represent it, mm, you're nasty. Okay. They're not like that. They're sitting at home going, I've got my cattle to take care of. I've got gardening to do. Um, I'm going to go help the people down the street that have things going on. I'm going to go to church. They're not do. Okay. I'm not going to go join them, but they're okay. They're minding their own business. Something is wrong with you. And, and, and you know what? They are also faith-based. They don't sit there and go, I need to prove something. I've got to have facts. I need you to listen to me. Sit down and shut up. Tell me about this. Tell they don't do anything like that. They just go, I have faith. Here, have some more bread. Would you like another plate of, you know, something? <laughs> they, the, the, there are Christians like that. Okay, so I'm not talking about those Christians. I'm talking about the ones that I'm going to identify on YouTube that make you just want to <laughs> you know, this happens. Okay. So how do we manage it? They are very skilled and practiced at doing something that is really designed to set you back on your heels and continually defending what is science while they deny it. While meantime, they don't bring anything to the table. We need to know that. And there's a, a technique or a couple different techniques, depending on what they're doing and how they're doing it. I mean, you can have somebody mad and putting you on your heels. I've got uh, a case in this. I'm going to show an example where I ask a question about Genesis and the person who wants to preach and teach will just continually evades the question, will not answer it. And we'll talk about why that is. My name is Dan Paulson. Welcome to the video. Let's get started on it. All right. What I'm going to do is kind of wander there a little bit. I don't want to pull up too many details because we're just, we're going to go through certain examples. What we want, what I'm really working on practicing today is just this mental process of thinking through what people are doing and trying to see where they're coming from, understanding the cause and effect. When we learn that cause and effect, when somebody's hitting you with something, try to stop, don't respond and react to it, look at it and understand what it is manifesting and that there is something driving it, what, that they, they can't see that. When you see it, bam, you got them. <laughs> you, you can control the whole conversation. The best they can do if you do this right, is get angry at you or run away from you. Or like in this one case, the guy just evade the question, constantly avoiding the question. Now, what I'm going to do without pulling it up, this is not a big deal. I just want to talk about this. I'm, I'm not going to show the example on the screen here, but uh, there's a video from Creation Ministries International. Flood expert gives five evidences for a global flood. This was posted up seven days ago. And these always get my attention. So I go there and... um one thing I notice off the bat is that there is an incredible amount of people looking at this saying, what a wonderful job you guys have done. And they, they continually talk about why science is fearful and runs away and will not dialogue with them. That, that somehow they've got a hold of something and because science just doesn't want to believe it and, and they don't even allow, um, you know, a, a a mutual dialogue between science and creationists about geology. And they've got a real problem with that. And you just shake your head and go, really? <laughs> um, you don't belong on the same table. You're not doing science. This is what you have to think through. If you distill what they're doing, you know, um, 
At one point, we think there's creation. As time goes on, we learn, we observe, we begin to process things, we begin to see things differently, and we realize, okay, it didn't just show up. There's a big mechanism going on that's huge, and it's been going on for a long time. We're a part of that. Science begins to see that. Religion doesn't like it. What do you want to believe? At some point, theism, in this case, people are saying all of existence because of creation, a supernatural creation, a non-demonstrable creation. Science is saying, here's flood, here's layers of things. This is over this geologic time period. This means, you know, all of this stuff that we know about there. And um, theism at one point says, no, none of that is true. But as people begin getting, you know, having a degree in something, oh, I've got a degree in some, something somewhere, then they go into geology or have maybe even a geology degree, but they're not doing science. What they're saying is creation. So what they're doing is learning things that science is doing and going, okay, we can't deny this stuff. We're going to accept this, but we're going to try to redefine what they're finding and still make it about God. No matter how much layering you put into this, if you distill it down, you get to one point that the theist is saying. No matter how much of this is here, no matter how much we understand it, it exists because of God. Existence, therefore God. That's why you don't belong on a science table. You're not doing science. You know, we can all at some point see what's there. But you're the one making supernatural claims and saying that that is the reason for it. You're grabbing science knowledge and trying to apply it to supernatural, but you only pick and choose what suits you and deny the things that don't. You're not doing science. That's why you don't get on the table. And you know what? I'm going to tell you to scale this. Do you... Are, are you aware of places where people think in, in conservative Christian communities that the Bible and Christianity and prayer needs to be in schools? This is a scale of that. Theists saying we want our supernatural in your natural. We want it taught in your science. No. Theist, I don't know what to say. In all earnesty, what you are doing does not, and what you're claiming does not meet the criteria for scientific discovery. You're trying to impose something that doesn't fit in science into science. You can't do that. You're bringing something in that cannot be questioned. Science can always be questioned, changed, and updated. Yours cannot, and yours cannot even be seen. What you need to understand is that no matter how many layers you try to stack onto it, it is simply, at the core, at the foundation, faith-based. You won't find proof. If it is provable, then it will no longer be faith-based. To everybody else, I've thought this through a long time, and here's what I realize. At some point, somebody has a core belief. They believe in what this is, and they don't want to let that go. They have a pre-conviction, and you can look and observe, and you know that that pre-conviction came from an upbringing and an exposure. It didn't come from being isolated and God coming and giving it to you. It comes from society. What we learn comes from society and it comes from various places around the world. But people get caught up in what they believe and they want it to be true to the degree that that is what they're trying to prove. And creationists, I mean, that's variable. There are people that are Christian that say, okay, well, it has been around for billions of years. They'll accept that, but they still say God created it. They will say things like, this is a part of the other, uh, uh, conversation I'm going to have too with, uh, you know, setting you back on your heels. I've had people come to me before. If I, they have an assumption. I don't commit to saying things unless I'm in a conversation. I might quote Jesus though. And somebody goes, you're a Christian and I'm not. <laughs> so I know what Jesus teaches and it's like a Buddha. Um, I might quote Buddha and that people would think I'm a Buddhist. You just know what these guys are teaching at some point and you know where it fits. They don't. They're, they don't know enough things to see that there's one commonality in the background. It, it, it just takes a much bigger awareness and an open mind. But anytime somebody is saying that existence is there or somebody coming at you and saying, well, if you don't believe what I believe, then tell me how, tell me how the universe came from nothing. Tell me how it came from nothing. And you sit there and go, what? I never said it came from nothing and I don't believe it came from nothing. Isn't the idea that if God instantly poofed it into existence, that is what came from nothing? Where's the God? You know, you get these mental things wrapped up in there and they're trying to 
pin what they believe on you. That's how the mind works. They're looking through their filters. They're projecting. Um, so be aware of that. When that, it, it can feel like an accusation and you look at it and go, that's the person right there. That's what they see. That's what they think because that's how they view it. And that's what comes to mind. They're not open-minded. They have a fixed something that is going to be wrong. You know that that's them. It isn't you. It is them. Okay, that's one of the ways we can understand things and see how cause and effect works. Again, by observing someone's actions and going, okay, that is coming. It didn't come from me. It didn't come from this comment section. That person is hitting me with something that, what, where did that come from? It came from that person right there. You know that. That tells you what they have going on. It gives you an initial hook into what they have. Don't mess with those things right away. (laughs) Leave them there. Just start collecting these data points. Get an understanding. I also want to say that I realize that what I'm saying is going to apply to certain people only. I, not everybody can uh, do this. But also, um, I, I always forget this, but it's incredibly important that Christians in particular, um, I would say militant YouTube Christians are the, the ones who know the Bible the least. It is incredibly important to know the Bible in order to succeed at this. What you're basically doing is using their own material on them and and exposing that they don't even know what it is. And what we see then and what we begin to realize and what we understand more and more and more is that people are not really using this as a lifestyle guidance like a, um, a Taoism would be. This is how we practice life. A Buddhism, this is how we practice life as a Buddhist get to Christianity. You just worship Jesus and live your life. We got something completely different going on. There is no longer a pathway to follow, although there are people who say there is and they follow it. But it, I, the diversity in Christianity demonstrates what is really, it's not a clear path, is it? It is very uh, much something that has to be interpreted and it gets interpreted in the mind of the person Let's look at an example of that very quickly of how that works. Okay, what I'm going to do is create my own verse. We're going to talk through it, how it works, why it is the way it is, show the layering in it, how it gets interpreted and how it gets messed up. And we're going to understand that that's exactly what's happening with Jesus material, how it gets messed up. Only I'm not going to use a Jesus verse. I'll use one that's my own. Now, one of the most important things in all material We're going to go on a path. There is something that we're hanging on to that's causing us to continue experiencing, continually experiencing something in accordance with that, good or bad. If it's a joyous thing, we can get triggered and have joy. We never worry about that. The problem is we have bad things happen to us that are unresolved and we get triggered by those and we continue to accumulate that and have a difficult life. We're hanging on to something that we need to let go of. And what it is, is a mental experience that is judged. This happened to me in my life. I feel this way about it. And as time goes on and I keep that feeling in place, that feeling is like a, an energy entity that continues to be a part of you that triggers out. That is incredibly important. Every teaching has that in there. You learn to find those, how to decode those. You could probably decode it all. Here's one very short. First, I'm going to use one from Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, caught in desire, you see only the manifestations. That is it right there. This is hanging on to something and cycling around it, caught in desire. There's two ways to use these verses, looking outward to the physical world or looking inward to the mental world, knowing that the terms are analogs, that they're not directly related. Example, if I'm naked in the physical world, oops, in public, yeah, bad thing. If I'm naked In the spiritual world, in public, good thing. That means that I am not covered. I have no fear. I have no shame. I'm not hiding anything. It's like, I'm good. I have no issues. Being naked in the spiritual world is different. So it's an analog that you have to look at and see how it works. Caught in desire, you see only the manifestations. A manifestation is the physical occurrence of something happening. Caught in desire. This is not desire in the physical world. Me, I want this, so I get it. It doesn't work, does it? It doesn't work. You go, what a goofy thing. Turn it inward. Convert the analogs. Caught in desire. Caught into what you won't let go of. You see only the manifestations. It continues to emerge. When you see those and can process them, you will find a lot. Buddha, right off the bat, first one. If a man has had an evil thought, pain follows like the wheel follows the foot of the ox that draws the carriage. Cycles of pain following pain. 
That's another one. I put videos up on that before, but you become component parts of those verse. If there's a clay pot, uh, wine skin, anything like that, when they, when those verses come up about, you are that vessel. You are whatever that is. When you, when you see that and start understanding that that way, you know, being the wanting to have new wine, but having an old wine skin and you can't put the two together. This is, I'm the old self and I want to have a new self. I want to have a new life experience, but I can't put a new life experience into my old self. I must first create a new self. I must get rid of my past. I must forgive. I must let go of the past before I can move on to a new life. That is how these work. Um, weeds from the garden, cyclically they emerge. Pain in childbirth, cyclic, cyclical pain. Yeah, they're continually there. You just have to understand what the analogs are. Okay, so I'm going to make one up that says an anchored ship cannot sail. For, cannot sail. I'll just leave it there. An anchored ship cannot sail. Okay, now what I've done is I've taken that process of me hanging on to something mentally and I've created analogs. The anchor and the ship represent me. The ship is me. The anchor is what I'm hanging on to. So I put something out there in the public that people go, okay, yeah, that's very benign. I can do something with that. I don't, I, I won't mind passing that around. If you tell people you got to look in, inward and heal yourself and forgive and let go of things, even the Bible tells you that. You want a better life? Forgive your brother. <laughs> forgive the odd. You'll be blessed. That's about turning inward and resolving those hurt issues. People that are Christian screaming, yelling, angry are acting out hurt issues. They're not doing what the teachings eventually says to do is to let go of that stuff, to forgive, to let go of things. You know, they're angry militant. They're obviously not following the Bible. They're just worshiping. Okay, we see that going on, that I cover all that well enough. Okay, so now an interpretation, you pass that into the public and somebody looks at it and goes, there's a plain language interpretation of that. An anchored ship isn't going to go anyplace. That's a good thing. Yep, all right, that's all it means. If you know it's in a body of work that is metaphoric um, you, and it's about yourself, you might look at it and go, oh, that applies to me. And you might even make the right transition and say, I am the ship and I am the anchor, but you haven't turned it inward. It's still in the physical world. That transition hasn't been completely made. So it's about, I'm not going to advance my career if I don't let go of this situation, if I don't move away from this, if I don't further my education or get away from these relationships that are harmful or hurtful to me, that all of those become incredible factors you look at and go, yeah, that's exactly what it means. By golly, look at that. that it works exactly right. That's perfect. Yeah, I got no problem with that. As long as I'm hanging on to something, I'm not furthering my advancement but it's in the physical world. Okay. But it's enough to make people go, that's, I'm done. That's what it means. All right. Somebody else comes along though and says, oh, an anchored ship cannot sail. That's good because all my life, I didn't have a family. I bounced off the wall everywhere. I had no safe port. There was no anchor. Finding a place to anchor is my safety, my sanctity, my family, my life, my community, whatever that may be. And you go, whoa, uh -oh, we got a problem. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a bad thing. What is it? Depends who you are. We just made a conflict and interpretation because it's in the physical world. Once you turn it inward, you go, okay, that goes away. It's about what you yourself are mentally hanging on to is going to continue to cycle around. You have to know that that's what you do to interpret it and that that is what they're doing to create that style of verse. Okay. Now let's think through that and see where the conflict is. You don't interpret it plain language. You just read it straight up. There are people that read the Bible that way. There are others that go, we cannot do that anymore. That's just, we know too much. That's, I, I cannot deny, I cannot deny life to the degree that I take it literally. So they begin to make adjustments with how it must work. Well, this, you know, seven days actually means, you know, 10,000 years per day or, you know, a thousand or something like, you know, they begin doing other things that are trying to interpret it, but it's always about the physical world. And then you look at that in the outside and go, boy, that, you know, people are coming at you saying, this is right. I know it is right. I did this and it works. Meanwhile, you're looking at them going, yeah, it's in the physical world. It's not what you're supposed to do with it. It's nesting something you haven't accessed. Um, so you're at a layer that is the ultimate deepest layer. You're at the core teaching while they are fighting over the, the outside. 
the shell, the, the physical interpretation. And um, so they don't know that. But when you know that, you can it, it gives you a better, I guess, a, a better avenue in your own mind as you're dealing with people, you know, not getting caught up in it, having discussions. Um, anyway, okay, I yeah, I don't know if that makes sense or not. I kind of went along into that verse right there, the description right there, but it seemed like it was flowing, so I just let it go. It was a good, uh, it was a good example of how how they're creating verses, how Jesus verses are created. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You want to be empty, devoid of these things. For yours is the kingdom of God. Life is good. Buddha, seek emptiness. You will find nirvana. Emptiness, poor in spirit. Nirvana, kingdom of God. Those are good things. That's what we're looking at in the analogs. They are going to mean the same thing at the core, but only when they're interpreted in the same way, no matter where you go. Just the analogs are different. That's all in the style, whether it's mythological or religious or spiritual intended for you to look inward. Okay, um, there's another one here. Uh, based on that, uh, there was a conversation I was having with somebody, and um, I don't think I'll bring it up either. I don't want to pick on anybody specifically, but it really came down to a person that had a channel that was, it, it's one that is, it's always easy to go after. You know, why does God let babies die of cancer? And you're like, oh, boy, okay, let's just jump right in there. And I went fishing. I just made a short comment about, you know, don't ask a theist any tough questions. They, you know, they'll get angry at you. And I left it at that. And the guy responded, what do you mean? You know, what does that mean? Or, uh, you know, who got angry or who's mad or something like that? And I said, I didn't say that, you know, so we're getting into this, um, already I'm, I'm floating things out there that are said in such a way that it's good. It's meant to, I'm, I'm fishing, I'm throwing lines out there, but I'm doing it very carefully. And the person comes back right away and they're like, what are, you know, who is angry? And it's like, I didn't say anybody was angry. I said, they will get angry if asked tough questions. So right off the bat, there's that correlation there. Anyway, the person said, okay, sorry about the semantics. Um, what do you got going on? Anyway, the, the discussion went on and it, it came down to me saying, I'll, you know, I'll go ahead and take charge. What I want you to do, it, it, um, he was talking about morals. Where do I, where do you get your morals from? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> that's that's not what I'm here for. My morals are not on display, and I'm I'm a guy out here. What I want to know is something about the Bible. You're teaching the the Bible. I want to know about Genesis 12. And if you read Genesis 12, what you'll find out is that it's uh, after the flood, after everything happens in Genesis, the the very first creation of Abrahamic religion begins after the flood. That is when God calls Abram and puts Abram and his wife Sarai into Canaan while there was a famine. And then what happened because there was a famine, they had to leave. They went to Egypt. Uh, Abram was fearful uh, because his wife was beautiful, thought that Pharaoh would hurt him. So he just says, tell you, you're my sister. So because Pharaoh's like, oh, it's just his sister. It's okay. Pharaoh marries her and in return gives Abram slaves and animals. And then later God catches on to what's going on, punishes them. And Pharaoh's the one that's going, what is it? What is it? You guys lied to me. Get out of here. Take your stuff and go. So this whole story is about giving up your wife, getting, because you're afraid, getting animals and slaves for it. And then having that person um, get angry at you because you lied to them to begin with and tell you to get out of there. Tell me where the values come from right there. And the guy would respond back with, actually, that's what you have to read. All I did was ask him, Explain Genesis 12 to me. That's basically what it says. Disappears for a while. Comes back and and goes, I don't understand the, uh, what you're getting at. I need to, you know, where do you get your values from? And, and I'm like, you know, I'm not teaching Dan Paulson here. He's teaching the Bible. What I want him to do is tell me the Bible. So it goes on this way and he keeps continually saying, I don't understand the question. I don't see what you're getting at. And then would ask me where I get my values from. So there's this loop going on where he's wanting to set me back on my heels, but I know that. So I'm not going to, I'm going to hold him to task. He's the one that's got a claim on the table. I don't. <laughs> so it's like, can you do this? And you know what? When you look at that, you realize what happened is the person really didn't know that, didn't think about that. They look through and find the good stuff. You disappear for a while. You come back and read it and go, after reading it and go, ooh, I can't explain that. I'm afraid I don't understand what you're talking about. Where do you get your values? Please tell me what Genesis 12 is about. 
I'm afraid I don't understand. Where do you get your values? <laughs> you <know? laughs> this is somebody that, that preached the Bible, don't know what's in there. Learn and go, oh, crap. Yeah, that's uh, okay. So the person didn't get angry in that case. It's just another one of those things you look at where somebody is trying to put it on you. You answer my questions and you're like, no, you have claims on the table. You do it. Watch. They don't. The objective is to keep you on your heels. You explain this. You do this. That doesn't, that's unproven. It's not true. It's like, it's factual. You're just denying it. It's a, it's a, it's a game they play, but anyway, all right. I don't know if there's any more else um, I wanted to say in this video. That's kind of a random blatherings there, but it goes along with the other one that, that you know, you run into this quite a bit. Um, a lot of the times where I go, it's like a, a talk between uh, like Richard Dawkins and, and Sherman or something like that. And, it, you know, these are very intelligent, educated, boy, you, you get in smart just watching them, but you will find people that come there that just. Are, are there, those are the militant Christian ones that'll just start slamming and scathing and calling them liars and all kinds of stuff. You know, all of the logical fallacy it is, it's all logical fallacy. Anytime you're taking supernatural and saying proof, true, whatever, it's a logical fallacy. There are people in that same religion that will say, you don't do that. It's faith-based. There is no proof. You stop doing that. It makes it, it makes it look bad, <laughs> but it tells us something about them actually. It makes me think that they don't have faith because they're trying to find proof. But what happens is science moves more and more and advances more and more. And this knowledge and awareness gets bigger and bigger. Where is God in all of this? God could be there, but if God's there, God is so far back. God is invisible. God is like reduced to, you know, this kind of a possibility. Now all that supernatural stuff, that's just us coexisting in a, in a field together, getting wild minded about things and, going off the deep end. Um, anyway, okay, I wanted to say that. If there is something beyond here, well, that's fine. But you know what? There's something in this material right here that no Christian accesses. What's that? Don't listen to Christians. Read it, interpret it. Find those cycles. Find the things you have to do. Find what to empty. All of that is in this material. It's a path to enlightenment nested in a carrier shell that will make people say, no, it means you're supposed to let go of that relationship. No, you're supposed to anchor in port. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're like, oh, shh. <laughs> it's about saying, you know what? I'm letting you off the hook out there because it's not about you. Actually, it's about what I'm holding up here that is hurting me. You get to that point. They don't get there. Okay, that's it for this video. Um, I told the person I was going to make it, but I made it so, so nobody can know who it is. I'm not, I don't want to pick on anyone. These are the things that are common. It's, these are not unusual. When you're out there talking and trying to discuss with people and trying to get your ideas out, and which I do quite frequently, and it doesn't work. It's, they're too big. <laughs> but, uh, but I certainly get out there. And in doing so, uh, typically the responses you get are, are kind of critical. Sometimes I go out there in a case like this though, you know, it's like, well, how do you explain a tsunami that kills a quarter of a million humans that are mostly all Catholic, that are mothers, fathers, babies, children, all getting torn apart, swept out to sea in a panic, dying a quarter of a million why does God allow babies to die of cancer? Come up with something difficult. Difficult. Open your mind. Look at the big picture. This, and then, and then avoiding the questions about the Bible. Yeah, that's the fruits of your garden. I hope you watch the video. I won't name your name, but that's that's just embarrassing. Okay, I will tell you what it's about. I am Abram. I am Sarai. In a famine in Canaan is the same place on the template is naked and unashamed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That was a good place to be. But what happened first sin in the Garden of Eden? What happens here? We go to Pharaoh. We have life experiences and it sends us on with all of our stuff. Then it happens again when we become Abram. We be, 
get converted to Abraham. We've gone through an iteration. Now I am Abraham. The same temptation comes up, but this time it gets headed off. A third time it happens. This time it doesn't even happen to begin with. There's a process going on that is a mental process. You can't explain why it's true because it's not true. It's a metaphorical story. It's like trying to say the tortoise won because he kept his eyes on God. Meanwhile, it's like, no, <laughs> there's a message in there. Hey, look up here. Spend more than a couple minutes with it. They had them memorized. This was their media. Okay, that's it for this video. <laughs> Comments, questions, go for it. Uh, fun stuff. All right, talk to you later.